Moving on. Obviously, going through some norms, Zoom norms. So awkward silences are obviously norm number one. Can you hear me? I will ask that often since I cannot see many of you. Strange crunch, heavy breathing. Sorry, no, you go. And bye if ever folks want to leave. So that's a fun um, tweet I fell upon that I was like so relevant because literally all of our Zoom calls consist of at least eight out of 10 of these. But for real, um, in terms of etiquette, I'm gonna remind folks to please stay muted unless and after the breakout where I'm gonna ask you guys to share. Um, camera is optional, although I would like to see some of your faces occasionally, um, especially if you have a question or if you wanna pop up, it makes me feel like I'm not speaking to myself and my team who I speak to every day and that I have no interest in speaking to you right now. Um, Again, if you are just coming in, please rename yourself by clicking on participants and then um, just have your first name, preferred gender pronoun, and the city that you're coming into. Drop any questions that you have as I go in the chat. Um, we have my teammate, Andrew, that'll be collecting your questions and we'll be reviewing them after. So even if it's relevant to, as I'm going, I'll, we'll come back to them and I'll come back to the point if it's something that you um, wish to explore further. Good. All right. Little icebreaker. I'm going to ask folks to comment how you're feeling or how you're coming in today in one word. Um, it could be in regards to the current context. So whether you're feeling shitty because of isolation, you're feeling stressed because you're like, I don't know what the hell to do with our comms. Um, you're feeling happy because the sun is out and you're like Carla basking in it. Whatever it is, in one word. Oop, sorry, I didn't mean to chip that in the chat. Unprepared, disoriented, overwhelmed, anxious, stressed, unsure, restless, excited, sleepy, good, hungry. <laughs> Tired, done, <laughs> warm, that's nice, fat, that's okay, fine, quote unquote. Okay, so overwhelmed, lots on the go, yeah. There's a lot of like overwhelmed, anxious, feelings of stress um, that I can definitely relate to. I'm gonna ask my team, did my team comment on here also? How are you folks coming in? Excellent, ready, hungry, okay. I'm coming in um, a little nervous, um, but very excited. Okay, thank you for sharing. So the agenda today, we're gonna go through what is constructive communication and why it's important now more than ever. What do you need to be highlighting in your communications right now? Um, what are we steering clear from? And obviously this is very relative and subjective, but in terms of um, constructive communications, we try as much as possible to steer clear from certain um, narratives and conversations. And then getting clear on who exactly you're speaking to. So Apathy's Born obviously speaks to youth aged 18 to 30. We're very clear on that. I know that for some folks, it's a little less unclear, but hopefully by the end of this, um, you can walk out a little bit clearer on, um, on who you're speaking to and how to do that. Good. I'm saying good, but I can't see your faces, so I'm assuming it's good. <laughs> okay, so what is constructive communications? Um, and why is it important? Um, firstly, I like to think that from someone, I come from the private sector, so I did marketing and branding and um, a lot of background in there. And I think for the first time since I've joined the community and nonprofit sector, um, I've seen a very clear opportunity for us to actually dominate the 
um, the space, so the public space in terms of the resources we share, the knowledge we share, the access to community that we share. Um, so up until now, I feel like, you know, the private sector and the business sector has very much dominated the public conversations, but right now, um, community is prioritized. And so if you're working in community or working as an organizer, um, it's a really great opportunity for you to take up the space that, you know, sometimes we're often a bit weary of taking up um, in the community sector. And then with that space comes a certain duty, um, a duty to make our communities feel good, to show up for our communities, to um, heal our communities for many, to be resourceful to our communities. And remembering that, that oftentimes, um, because we're interacting directly with folks and people are seeing us as knowledge holders, our approach and what we're communicating and, and the tone and the messaging behind what we share really has the impact to affect folks. Um, obviously, there's an abundance of state of emergency messaging from news media um, that leads to panic, fear, divisiveness, negative thoughts, actions, feelings, you name it. We're all feeling it or we've all felt it at some point over the past um, almost three months. So it's there. I think the media does a great job at um, doing that and, and spreading that. And um, that's what they're here for. They're, they're here to share information. Um, I don't want to call it propaganda because, but, you know, sometimes it is a bit of propaganda and I think we should leave that to the media and really um, focus on how as community leaders or community builders um, or community managers, we can use our spaces to provide relief from stress um, because obviously social media can contribute to mental health tremendously as we're all plugged more than ever, but it also has a really nice opportunity to um, provide relief if we take the some time to be intentional about the resources and the content that we're sharing. And really think about how this is affecting your communities, whomever you're serving. So what do you need to be highlighting? When it comes to communications in general, I think where the community sector, um, what I've observed lacks a little bit of um, clarity on is really like a brand strategy. So your communication strategy, um, who you are, what your messaging is, what you are sharing, when you're sharing it, why you're sharing it. Um, so I think before you can even dive into constructive communications and all these things, um, really getting clear on what your brand essence is. And we'll get, I'll get to that a little bit more right after this. Um, but that's essentially your raison d'être. Why does your organization, or if you're not, you know, repping a certain organization, your mission, your um, initiative, yourself exist? Um, what support or expertise can you or your organization offer during these times? So a lot of folks um, are sitting on a wealth of, of knowledge um, and resources that they can be providing to community um, online. So a lot of us are used to gathering in groups um, and sharing that information in groups, but how given this context can we be intentional about sharing the knowledge that we usually share in smaller circles digitally and growing that? Um, why should people know, talk, follow you or your organization? So there's a lot happening right now. Um, obviously, the digital space is inundated with content and lives and Zooms, you name it. Um, so really reinforcing your brand essence and getting clear on why people should look to you for certain things. And then obviously, how is this translated into the content that you create and share? So how do you want people to feel when they interact with you or your organization? Um, really thinking about emotions is oftentimes how we position it. We want people to laugh when they come on our page at Apathy is Boring. We want them to get educated when they come on our page. We want them to get informed. Um, we want them to be reflective. So really think about, okay, what emotions you're trying to pull. And this, this is very much um, a strategy pulled from 
marketing. So when private brands or businesses market, I'll take, you know, Nike. Nike is very intentional about getting clear on how they want folks to feel after seeing a Nike ad. Um, it's not random. It's not, uh, you know, a fluke. It's very clearly planned. And I think that being intentional about that is super important. Also, again, what resources, knowledge do you hold that you can make public? Um, a lot of folks, again, are either um, organizing in person, um, providing resources to groups in person, providing uh, ideas or support in person. How do you now take all of that and make sure that you are being just as resourceful in your communications? So just as resourceful online, when it comes to your social media, your newsletter, how is your newsletter um, being resourceful and then tying back to your brand essence and really think about what resources and knowledge your community needs to navigate these times. So obviously, um, Apathy is Boring, serving a youth audience aged 18 to 30, we're constantly thinking about, okay, what do youth need right now? Youth need resources to understand what access to um, government support they have, whether they're a student, whether they're um, indigenous youth, how do we make sure that we take that information and make it accessible? We're also constantly thinking about um, what lighthearted content youth need, so mean culture. We spoke about that um, during our digital communities gathering for those who were on it. Mean culture is huge for youth, um, both millennials and Gen Z. So really being intentional about being relevant um, to your target audience and how you speak with them. Okay, so brand essence. This is part of a bigger brand strategy that we're not gonna get into today. But if you get clear on your brand essence, then that can be your driving force for all of the content that you produce. Um, and essentially your brand essence is a one-liner. So you have your vision, you have your mission, which tends to be fairly extensive um, and mapped out and, and a bit longer. So two to three lines or a paragraph. Your brand essence now takes your mission, takes your vision and really condenses it into one line. Um, and it's essentially your brand's reason for being expressed in the simplest way you can. And it's the catalyst for new products and services, for selecting partners, for the content that you create, for um, the newsletters that you put out. They all stem from that one liner. So we intend to, or we do this, da 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 da, da da da, in one line. And it's essentially gonna be used as your communications North Star. If you get clear on your brand essence, everything else stems from that. So our brand essence at Apathy is Boring is supporting youth to become change makers in their everyday lives. Simply put, it encompasses our mission, which is to support youth um, in becoming civically engaged our vision to have a Canada where youth are involved in democracy at all levels. And then it's condensed, taking those two things together and really just providing it in one line. So what we exist to do in terms of our communications is support youth to become change makers in their everyday lives. So all of our communications um, tools, resources, content revolve around that. And we have so many ideas sometimes that we um, forget and you want to repost because you see what someone else is doing and we often have to remind each other but does it tie down to supporting youth to become change makers in their everyday lives because if it doesn't it's not our job to share it somebody else will do it and so through that brand essence we create things like resources um, that serve to engage youth with what's happening and be, become resourceful. Again, through that brand essence, we intend to make youth laugh and connect with them one-on-one. -on -one. 
um, things like this that are, it seems simple and maybe irrelevant and or maybe too simple that folks don't even think about it. But memes like this are actually our, generate our biggest reach. So it's with that that folks actually come back to our page and have access to our resources. So sometimes we think we're, we, we think too deep into this and we're like, oh my gosh, how do we map out a strategy and how do we tell everything that we're doing the most? Keep it simple. Really, a tweet like this or a meme like this will bring folks back to your page tenfold. Um, I think during the federal election, we had one tweet like this that reached over 200,000 people. Simple. Um, back to our brand essence and to the content that we share. So reminding folks, obviously, of the current context is important um, in a light, witty, youthful way. Um, but it still ties back to supporting youth and becoming change makers, which is essentially right now staying home. And then supporting youth to become change makers in their everyday lives by providing content to help them reflect. So we have engaging content, we have reflective content, you have informative content, you have educational content that all tie back to the brand essence. But you really want to be able to do all of those things through your communication strategy. Also, an important um, thing to, re to remind, and that I, also, uh, that I often um, remind our, our social media uh, coordinator that the 80-20 rule, so 80% of the content that you share, you can actually source online. There are so, there's so much content out there. You don't need to create it all. You don't need to um, go out of your way to you know, get a graphic designer. I know a lot of folks are like, yeah, but you don't have the resources to create all this. Literally, 80% of what we pull out, um, we collect from pages that we follow from partner organizations that are doing equally amazing work. And then 20% is the content that you create. 20% is the content and the resources that we go out of our way to put together. Um, it's the resources and the knowledge that we hold that we then kind of take out of our brains and out of our um, policies and procedures and out of our you know, our Google Drive and repackage to the world. Am I going too fast? Let me check the pulse. Good? Okay. What we're steering clear from, um, instilling doubt in the system. So note that this is very different from questioning the system. Um, this is very different from, you know, being critical of the system. But in the communications, in our communications, what we don't want to do is inst oops, sorry, instill doubt. Um, because that doubt is translated into a negative emotion that whether you like to think of or not, um, might not bring back folks back to your page or might create more anxiety and stress towards your community. Um, we also don't propagate fear. Um, we know that a lot of things are scary. We know that um, these uncertain times are, you know, very much paralyzing for folks. But in terms of the content that we create and the content that we share and the communications that we put out there, um, our message is very much one of hope, of opportunity, of, um, you know, a time to question, a time to, you know, find resources, et cetera. Um, dis and misinformation, oftentimes, again, unintentionally done so by um, sharing articles that we see online, um, that by sharing tweets that we see online that are not necessarily fact-checked or true. Um, so really being intentional about double-checking the facts, the stats that we put out there. And then we also steer clear of disillusionment um, in the sense that we don't want to paint a happier picture than what is. The fact is that this crisis is, you know, literally ripping apart racialized communities and indigenous communities. The fact is that the gendered impacts of this crisis are um, very much affecting 
um, women and non-binary and LGBT folks 10 times more. So we don't want to disillusion folks into thinking, well, you know what, it's okay. And yes, ça va bien aller and all the rainbows and it's all great. But we also want to be mindful of the realities about, that's out there. And lastly, who are you speaking to? So getting clear on your audience. I think a lot of folks want to speak to everyone at the same time. And I think we're guilty of that often sometimes and we have to check ourselves sometimes and remind ourselves who we're speaking to and um, the tone that our, that our communications can take on sometimes, but getting clear by building an avatar. So who are they? Who are you speaking to? Um, who's your ideal? Again, this is stemmed from marketing practices. Um, who is your little avatar that you're speaking to? How old are they? What do they like? What do they listen to? Where do they get their information? How do they speak? What matters to them? And by putting yourself in their shoes and communicating from there is where you have the real impact. Um, obviously, it's easier for us because we are youth speaking to youth. Um, so we understand that that may not be the case for everyone. You know, some folks are speaking to folks in different communities, um, in which case I highly encourage building community allies to help build your content, um, building community allies to help you communicate or reach a certain audience that you don't necessarily have access to or that you want access to. Go ahead, Natalia. <laughs> Well, I'm comfortable. It's just that English is not my first language. I'm from I'm from uh, Montreal, so let me know if it's not clear. But um, I'm working for the uh, Occupational Therapist Association, but like the um, Quebec chapter, and I'm I'm working for them, especially for the Facebook page. And yes, yeah, so we really want to um, feel that, that make the occupational therapists feel that we are all in this together right now, because of course our work is very um, affected by the COVID-19. So yeah, our mission, especially right now, is to uh, make the occupational therapists feel like they are, um, you know, well equipped for that and that, yeah, we are all in this uh, together. Um, but sometimes it's uh, difficult because I think, especially in Quebec, we uh, don't have um, a strong uh, association feeling. Like compared to the rest of Canada, it's different, you know. So, but right now, I think with the the crisis, it's uh, it's getting stronger. So we have more uh, interactions on our Facebook page. So I feel like people have. Um, this need right now. So I don't know if it answers the question, but <laughs> that's my reality right now. <laughs> and what are some of the resources that you folks are sharing right now to respond to that need? Um, uh, we are doing some um, webinar. Uh, is it the word in English? Yes. Yeah. So online classes uh, for them, like to help them to uh, adjust their practice. Uh, like how to do, you know, um, meetings with the clients with Zoom, for example. And also uh, we did um, a series of uh, also a webinar, but on uh, resilience with uh, an occupational therapist that is specialized in resilience. So that was a very good one. And also we just share that, um, you know, on simple articles on the news that, um, uh, make people see that, you know, occupational therapy is very important right now in the context. So mm. that's basically what we are doing. Great. Amazing. Maybe one thing that, um, if you haven't thought about it, doing it was sharing, I'm presuming during like one-on-one -on -one, um, classes um, or um, not classes, like appointments between a therapist and a person, they give like concrete tools um, for folks to navigate through. So maybe sharing some of the tools that um, occupational therapists are communicating with clients right now mm -hmm. publicly in order to provide more information on um, like concrete information on what folks can walk away from if they um, decide or choose to 
work with an occupational therapist that also like broadens your reach do you know what i mean mm. that uh, yeah that's interesting <laughs> <laughs> great thank you for sharing do folks have um any other ideas for Natanya, maybe in terms of other resources that they can share right now that would be helpful no great that's fine my team any other tips tools no okay um yeah i think um just to echo like what you said about like sharing the tools that you discussed in your webinar, but making it more accessible and uh, useful to people like through your social media, having them hosted maybe on your website and um, like everything that you share it, like for us, when we share stuff on our webinar, we also make sure that it's recorded and then shared back with everyone who's participating so that they can then take this and apply it very uh, practically. And um, like, yeah, so they can put it in practice afterwards and refer back to it. So the content that you draw up for anything that you share in a closed group, make sure that all of that content is always accessible to them after they leave the conversation so that they can have something to go back to. Um, and if you, whatever is discussed, like here, we always get so, um, we, we get so much, uh, we learn so much during these webinars from people who are attending it that we do, um, it's, it's very possible for us to like take snippets and like turn that into content and then share it in our um, communications channels for others to also benefit from this. Merci. Merci. <laughs> We had a question from Rabbit um, about speaking more um, about not instilling doubt in the system. We are, I mean, it's very easy for us to say as a nonpartisan organization. So I understand that, you know, depending on what your, your mission is, whether personally or the mission of your organization, that may differ. However, for me, the, in terms of the feeling of empowering, if you want to Questioning the system is, is different for me in terms of, instead of like instilling doubt. So instead of saying, this is happening, this is wrong, this is horrible, look at how this is doing this. How can we flip that into concrete questions um, about how can we, or solutions, how can we build upon this post COVID? What opportunity is this providing us? What lens is this shining? on you know the disparities in our social realities um and really kind of getting folks to question do you know what i mean does that make sense okay great um so our, our breakout rooms aren't working right now so i'm going to keep everybody here and encourage folks to share here whomever feels comfortable you don't have to get on the camera if you don't want to, um, but in one line, what it is you're working towards. Um, and then maybe we can collectively provide folks with some tips, tricks, tools. And I invite everybody to join in the conversation if you hear something that um, is interesting or if you have an idea that, you, that kind of comes to your head, you're all in, a lot of you are already doing this work. So please, by all means, Help me you can, out. You can also, um, just to jump in, you can also leave us questions. Uh, if you don't feel like talking about it, you can also just leave uh, a question that's like, uh, that gives us a little bit of context into exactly what you want us to talk about in the chat. And then we'll try to like read it, uh, we'll, we'll read it again and then answer it for you. And then we can get other people. If you have other insight on what, um, or any kind of like, um, uh, advice for them to do that you're doing in your community or in your org or in your initiative that you want to share with them, that would be great too. So you can definitely use the chat for that. Who's the next brave soul? Um, hi, uh, my name is Sarah. Do you hear me well? Hi, Sarah. Hi, um, so I'm based in Montreal and uh, my project is very new. It's very recent. 
Um, so my friends and I were university students. We started working on a project. It's an info clinic for marginalized women to uh, to give them the information and the resources um, that are available to them. So what we do, our mission is really to facilitate and uh, simplify the governmental um, stuff. So just make it simple. We're all in polit political science, so we understand pretty well um, uh, what the government is talking about, and we're pretty good at doing research. So that's what we do, and we so we have a request form that uh, women start to uh, fill up, and then we uh, we call them back to uh, you know to give them the what will what will be uh, appropriate in their situation uh so it's very new and um it's we're still thinking about the marketing so right now we're we're um we're trying to reach the media we're uh, we're like sharing to in in different groups the thing is that we still didn't necessarily define our group in the sense that yes it's women especially marginalized women but Oh, I think we have a a group now. Are we in a group? Nope, you're still with me. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry. Yeah, so, but the thing is that I don't know, I think we should focus on the Quebec. Yeah, I think we should focus on the Quebec. But yeah, so I don't know if you guys have any idea, if you think of something that could be done differently. And yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I heard you say was it's an info clinic. Is that, uh, is it virtual or is it over the phone? So it's basically they, they, uh, they have to fill up a form, yeah. a request form online or send us an email and we call them. We call them or we send them an email depending on what they, they like. And also what is cool about the info clinic is that we're offering it in three different languages, uh, in French, uh, English, and Arabic. And um, it's mostly targeting um, Arab women, to be very honest, because we're working with just the Spam Quebec, mm -hmm. which uh, which is a small non small nonprofit that works with the Muslim women. Oh, you cut off there. Oh, sorry. So, so I said we're working with a small nonprofit, just the Spam Quebec, which is mostly working with Muslim women. Mm. Great. And then, so is the, what's the intention of the Eiffel Clinic? Is it to provide information on um, like health matters specifically? Yes, exactly. So, so it's basically to simplify what the government is saying and, and uh, like redirect them to the, to the right resources that are uh, available in their neighbor or the neighborhood or, yeah. Great. Thank you for sharing. Um, and right now, are you mostly communicating, I'm presuming digitally? So social media? Yes, exactly. We're using Facebook at the moment. Uh, mostly we have our own website as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what are some of the Sorry, we don't ahead. have as no, it's fine. And we don't have as much traffic on our website as on Facebook, so that's why we started on Facebook. And in one line, if you could try to summarize in one line, so like back to the brand essence, what it is that you guys, your raison d'être? Uh, it's basically to provide resources and simplify information to uh, to women in uh, uh, vulnerable women. Great. So provide information or provide resources and simplify information for um, vulnerable women or marginalized women. Yeah. Awesome. So then the key for you is taking that brand essence and then applying it. So on your social media, how are you providing um, resources and information to vulnerable women and to racialized women on your social media? How are you doing that? What information are you sharing that speaks to vulnerable or mar marginalized women on your social media? Um, same thing for your websites. Are there amount? Are there resources that you can put together for folks who um, don't feel comfortable maybe calling in yet? Can your social media and your website alone 
have a minimum amount of information and or resources that speak to the woman that you want to call before they um, sum up the courage to call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't think about that, but yeah, it's very true. Does anybody else want to chime in there? Um, so I work for a 2LGBTQ uh, youth organization and uh, one of the things I hear most from the youth is that like the messaging being offered from the government about health stuff is just not made for them and that they're talking, you know, that this whole thing is, they're, they're experiencing a level of isolation that is coupled with the fact that they were already experiencing in many cases isolation before COVID hit. Um, and so they feel often left, like, like th we're doing all of this just to help old people and the old people in my life don't even like me. So what's the point? <laughs> um, and um, if we're honest. Um, and so I keep on trying to figure out and wonder how to kind of like make like without redoing the wheel, because I'm not a scientist, like I'm not a scientist. I'm not up to date on all the research. I can't have a hundred percent, like there's no one out here who has a hundred percent of the right answers. So it obviously can't be me. Um, how do we kind of like provide information about the, the pandemic that's like also adapted to their realities, adapted to the realities of people who oftentimes are either the essential workers or relatives of the essential workers um, and who are facing like this, just like this, uh, realizing that they're not getting the information they need. Mm -hmm. That wasn't really an answer. It was more just a question. Sorry. <laughs> so. I, mean, I think that's a good, that's a good playoff of um, Sarah's question um, or yeah, her question in terms of, you mentioned that a lot of youth don't feel like health information is accessible. Um, Sarah, you are providing um, health information and resources. So I think remembering that a lot of folks, the same way that at Apathy is Boring, we're very aware that a lot of conversations around democracy and civic engagement are not accessible. The government websites are not accessible and you, bet your ass off that 18 year olds aren't on like government.ca trying to figure out <laughs> and read shit. So we take it as like our responsibility to be the intermediary between um, government information and youth. So we're like, okay, there's government, there's apathy is boring, there's youth. And so Sarah and or Otto, um, and for a lot of you folks, I think, um, figuring out where you stand as that intermediary. So Sarah, if you're saying there's, you know, health information, there's you, and then there's marginalized women. So how are you as the bridge and the knowledge holder of health information, ensuring that the information that up, that's up here that oftentimes doesn't get to marginalized women gets to them um, in an accessible, easy, um, way and then who are you working with because again community partnerships for us are, are key I think in working in community in general you can't do the work that you do without working with other folks mm -hmm. um, who are you working with to disseminate those messages who are the partner organizations who also have the same um, brand essence as you because a lot of folks are doing the same thing and have the same values so how do you tie in and join forces with other organizations and or people who are doing the same work or have the same mission or believe in the same things and help them um, or have them help you disseminate your messages. Does that make sense? I think um, to, to jump off of that, I think it's uh, like you said, if you position yourself between the source of information and the audience, I mean, you, since you're the one serving that community, you know so much about that community to begin with. I mean, you've done your research, you've been serving them for a long time, um, or that you're starting to serve them. Um, you also know in what format 
in what capsule that information needs to be for them to be able to access it, right? Like if we're talking about accessibility and you being the middle person, I think a lot of it depends on what has worked with them beforehand. Now you're saying that we don't get a lot of traffic on our website, so we are relying on Facebook, that is an amazing switch because so many people are on Facebook. And like, I mean, personally, my parents who don't go on any website are on Facebook all day. So it is easy for them to like look at videos and understand information that is like slowed down in smaller size and like catered to them that they couldn't probably un like properly understand when Justin Trudeau is doing his live, you know, information capsules. So how do you break down things that are in formats, either in infographics, in, in pictures, or in animation, something that your audience is going to really, A, be interested in, because it's one thing to sit through like an hour worth of talking to kind of get like that 15 minutes that really interests you, then to actually just access those 15 minutes and get that information that you need to go about your day in your life, right? So that. Does that answer your question, Sarah and or Otto? Yes, thank you. Great. Um, okay, so I'll take some questions that came through the chat. For other nonprofits, what are the modes of communication you use? Here in Northern BC, we have a significant population that doesn't have reliable access to technology or social media. Do you use other forms of communication? Yeah, that's a really good question, Kiara. Um, in regular times, yes. Um, so in regular times, we try as much as possible to activate in person, um, be intentional about events that we attend, um, considering that we're very aware that unengaged youth are not gonna come to us um, and they're not gonna go to the government. So it's really our role to ensure that we get to them wherever they are. Um, so whether that's at street festivals, whether that's at parties, concerts, um, literally malls, um, walking down the street, you name it. We try to have a presence um, everywhere that youth would be, where we actually physically hand them and have these conversations with them face to face. Um, so if in your territory, they don't have access to reliable, um, internet connection or digital connections, then where else can you find them in physical person and, and literally hand out and have these conversations in person? And then I think again, back to um, partnering with the organizations who do have access to them. Um, that's really, really, really key. Really having a, like a partnership and an outreach strategy is fundamental to getting your message out, but also not feel like you're the only one doing that work. A lot of folks are already doing the work that you're doing, um, oftentimes even better, and speaking to that, to that um, audience a lot better than you are. So and kind of being okay with asking them to help you and, and seeing where you can help them and tag teaming there. Does that answer your question, Kiara? I don't know if anybody else has, wants to chime in on that in terms of providing other forms of communications than digital. Do you want to go, Otto? Yeah. Well, one thing that we do is we um, have switched one person on the team to a cell phone so that you can call or text as their first point of contact. And um, especially for, we like made a uh, business cards that just say like our our summary sentence uh, and the phone numbers and give them out also to youth that we're already in contact with because they're often that word of mouth is really powerful for sure great um let's see another question coming up todd do you want to grab the questions okay Next one I think was from Brianna. Yeah, so we have, do you have any tips on reaching an audience who might not have access to internet and who may not follow you online? And yeah, so they don't, I think that kind of ties into what we discussed now, I, pretty much. Um, I think, 
go ahead. Yeah, so I think those were the main questions. I think uh, on the chat, you still have quite a few people answering those, um, those questions also amongst themselves. So uh, we have one, uh, Rabbit said, I'm in lower mainland Vancouver and we're communicating on Instagram mostly with our youth. We're aiming for text communication. So like setting up phone trees and text, just like uh, Otto was saying, uh, that also does help. Um, it also feels like more secure and private and intimate. So definitely, um, I like that idea. Uh, Wait, before, hold on, let's just do one by one. Yeah. Um, so back to folks who might not follow you. Yeah, access to internet. Yeah, so we answered that. I don't know if, Brianna, you, that our initial answer was good for you in terms of like figuring out where they are. Um, I think good old marketing and good old like non-digital world comes in well when it comes to accessing folks who aren't following you. Like literally, if your if your presence is only online or digital, or if people only know you on social media, then you're also doing something wrong. Mm. Um, in the same way that if people don't know you on social media or don't follow you and you have zero social presence, you're also doing something wrong. So I think balancing um, in communication, that fine line between a strong digital presence and yes, social media and yes, Instagram and the followers and yes, yes, yes. But then if all of this were to crash tomorrow, would folks mm -hmm. still be able to find you? Um, and what are good old traditional methods, whether that's the phone book, um, again, dropping things online, little papered, um, you can get, depending on your budget, obviously, and resources, ads, um, Facebook ads remains the cheapest ad method, um, to this day. So print ads are still ridiculously expensive. I don't know who the hell even <laughs> magazines, but, um, <laughs> print ads remain ridiculously expensive. Billboards remain ridiculously expensive. I don't know who the hell is driving and looking up anymore, but Right now, Facebook ads are very, very accessible and really allow you to target folks who you want that don't follow you and that you want to follow you. So you can literally say, and then Otto and I had this conversation um, recently last week, you can literally say, okay, we want to target um, two LGBTQ plus youth that live in Montreal, BC, Ottawa, and Toronto um, that are interested in method man and beyonce you can literally get that specific on facebook um, and it's not expensive so budgeting also if you have a small budget of a hundred dollars a month if that's too much fifty dollars a month will do you really fine um, in terms of getting folks that are not following you mm -hmm. hope i answered your question brianna okay thank you <laughs> great um, you want to go next, Taha? There aren't very, there aren't very many questions in the chat. So if anybody wants and has a question, uh, you can please let me know, maybe just by putting it on the chat or like turning on your, uh, video and just waving at us so mm -hmm. we can see who has questions. Want to share? Anybody else feel comfortable? sharing we can also go the breakout rooms apparently um is working so if we want to break out into smaller groups and folks feel more comfortable there we can also do that oh we have one oh working with influencers also yes youth influencers auto mm -hmm. do folks have any specific questions in terms of um, issues or things that they're struggling with that they would need recommendations with, whether it's social media, whether it's um, content creation, et cetera. Or is anyone even like thinking of starting an initiative um, in their community to bring people together? Like in this time, has this, has like the pandemic kind of encouraged you or 
um, inspired you to start your own thing? And if you do want to, like, if you want to talk to us about what it is and maybe like questions that you may have for a startup. No. Okay. So then maybe we can, Oh yeah, go oh. ahead. Josh. Hi. Um, hi, my name is Josh. Uh, so I work at T3 Junior theater. It's a local theater company in Montreal. Um, and I guess, so I will say our brand essence is change the world one play at a time. Um, and we have an upcoming fireworks digital showcase coming up, um, features a lot of like diverse playwrights. And I guess my challenge really with social media has been one, not instilling doubt, but then also not framing these artists as victims of, of COVID-19 because yes, the arts have been like suffered, have suffered immensely, but at the same time, like it's kind of trying to find that way to empower artists to stay inspired, but at the same time also giving that space um, in this digital showcase, because like this is goes back to our mandate again, change the world one play at a time. Um, so again, my question is how to like really, like what is the line between like not distilling, uh, instilling doubt, but then also not like framing these artists as victims of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um. I think to the not instilling doubt, or if they're, if they are victims of what's going on or greatly affected by what's going on, I think it's, it's again, it's okay to, to state that. Um, I think how you um, do so and the openness, maybe this is a great art conversation to have and to open up the conversation um, amongst artists around, um, how the system can better serve them going forward. What are the flaws in the system that allowed them to essentially get to um, where they are today? How, when we're thinking about rebuilding um, tomorrow and, and coming up with you know, policies, um, better policies that can better serve folks who are in the arts, um, you know, like, do you have any recommendations? Can you open up a discussion? Is this a webinar just around um, you know, how the arts has been affected that you can create um, and have folks chime in. Is this a post on Instagram that you can share? Um, you're welcome, Margaret. So I think if it is a reality, not naming it wouldn't do anybody justice. I think you, you absolutely have the right to, to name it, but how do you do so in a constructive manner in a way that folks are engaging with the system and not um, pushing further away from it, which creates even more issues, you know, if you ask us. So how do we kind of keep folks constantly engaged in the conversation um, to help create a better system? Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Great. Do folks have any other ideas for Josh? Also, is there a way to like do a virtual play? I would totally like log onto a virtual play. Yeah, I mean, some people are doing it. I mean, the theater world is trying to come up with like very creative ways of doing it online, but then mm -hmm. so there's people who are for digital and then people who just don't want to do live art because they just want it to be in person. Yeah, so, I hear that. Yeah, it's just a difference of opinion, but I'm for all digital, so yeah. I hear that. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else have any tips or tricks for Josh? Or want to open up? Go ahead. Otto? <laughs> Sorry, I feel like I've been talking a lot, but um, one thing I always do, because we have like a similar situation where um, like I have a newsletter that's not for youth and I have a Facebook and Instagram where I know that I'm trying to reach people under 25, but my audience is primarily people over 25 and people will continue following us because they want to know about what we're doing. They want to donate that kind of thing um, after they've left our age range. And so I always try and focus on the pause, you know, like as like DJ was saying, it's just like all about framing. So instead of being like, these artists are so hard done to being like support these artists <laughs> you know it's just like a way of flipping it 
Um, and that's like something that we, I often have to think about because my main goal of P10's page is to uh, be positive because LGBTQ youth uh, are abundantly aware of the fact that they are often oppressed. And I, I can name that to them. And sometimes that is helpful, but what is more helpful is to let them know that they're like supported and loved and like all of these other things. Um, and so trying to figure out a way of like it's a really hard thing that I always try and figure out is like how to how to present the actual realities of our youth while not depressing the actual youth that are on our page. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Does anybody else feel called to share what they're working on or some issues that they're having or questions that they're having? Um, I just wanted you guys' opinion on using brand ambassadors, um, could be employees or influencers to get your message across. Um, I work for a social housing provider in Toronto, and a large sector of our clients or tenants um, can't reach us because they don't have the resources or tools to get access to our information online. So we've been using our employees who've been sent out to the front lines because they're essential workers to mm. kind of disseminate that information. So I just wanted your, you guys' opinion of, has anyone used that technique before? How effective has it been? Um, especially now during, um, during these times, um, has any of your tactics changed? Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, I mean, we, so two things I heard from you. So one, using influencers, and then two, um, I think you mentioned using staff and employees to, to disseminate the message. Correct me if I'm wrong there. Yes, you're right. Okay, great. Um, so we are firm believers in, in um, I mean, I'd say firm. I'm a skeptical believer in like influencers um, skeptical because I think that using the wrong ones um, don't necessarily won't, won't get you anywhere. So you can have someone with, you know, a hundred thousand followers but who aren't speaking to your audience. You're speaking to the void. Um, but I think if you're pairing up with the right people um, who have access to the community that you're trying to get, a hundred percent. Um, and again, I think we have this conception that influencers are folks with a high follower. Um, when an influencer is simply someone who has impact in their community or within their community. So this person can have, you know, a thousand followers on Instagram, but they are known and recognized in their community as um, a voice of, of change and of, and of leadership. So yes to absolutely using um, influencers, but being mindful of who and how and um, deconstructing this idea that influence is numbers online. And then I think when it comes to um, using staff and employees, I'm personally uh, a firm believer. I think um, our ED and um, you know our research per, um, manager and our programs manager, we've had conversations several times around personal branding um, and the power that, you know, be using your own platform and your own self to spread the message of the org um, can, can do. I think that it also lies on comfort level. Some folks are like, bitch, I just want to do my job and, uh, you know, work for the org and go home. I don't want to be out there advocating for you. For you. And that's perfectly fine. Um, and I think some folks are a little bit more open, in which case they need more guidance. Um, how do you use your platform? How do you use your voice? What are the liabilities that come with that? Um, the freedoms that come with that? Um, or the loss of freedom that comes with that, et cetera. But if, you're, if your staff is available and open to, by all means, because you're working in like precarious, um, I guess like in a sensitive uh, sector, Maybe making sure that, you know, if they are front, if the staff is frontline or using themselves as frontliners for you, making sure that they have the resources um, to do so, you know, and the support to do so, both 
emotionally, mentally, but professionally. Good. Does that answer your question, Brianna? Yes, thank you. Does anybody else want to chime in for Brianna or does anybody else have staff or employees as frontliners? Otto, are you nodding? <laughs> Do you have anything to say there? Um, it really depends for, for that one. It depends also on uh, the platform you're using. Like LinkedIn has to be staff first, that uh, the staff that do the branding for you. Um, but it's, it's a difficult thing for us to navigate because um, so like a lot of the staff at Project 10 have very popular Instagram accounts and it's a difficult line for them to manage because um, people already are kind of expecting out of a Project 10 a mental health support whenever they need it, which is not something we can do. And that's already a difficult conversation to have. And then on Instagram, also people expect you to be on there at all times. So that's like the most important for us, at least is the most important thing is to have a conversation early on with our staff around their boundaries and how to assert their boundaries and how to be clear about what they're offering and be clear about this is their own, like they're on here on the weekend because they're not at work. And if you need something from them at their work account, this is their work account. That's how to get in touch with them. For sure. I also think that in community, because we're, we're doing um, God's work, quote unquote, we have a hard time already naturally setting these boundaries. Um, and a lot of us are already working more than we should be. Um, so capacity oftentimes becomes an issue. So if staff are on the front line, really being honest with them about, yeah, to, to, to Otto's point about their boundaries and what they need, how they feel comfortable, when they feel comfortable unplugging, when they should unplug. Um, I know personally during the federal election, we were not unplugging at all, ever. Um, and that gets to us. So yeah, thank you for sharing. We had a question on the chat about how to engage and provide resources for neurodiverse communities. And we had quite a few answers in chat there, but if people want to use their voices <laughs> to, to talk more about neurodiverse communities and what resources they have built within their orgs or within their initiatives to address this kind of need, please do take, take on your mic. <laughs> I'm just catching up. All right, to be incredible information accessible with margin. Resources and comments that info guy, which is one. Okay, great. Awesome. Okay. Um, I guess maybe I'll spend the last 10 minutes. Um, giving you guys concrete, uh, whoop, hold on, okay, um, tools in terms of the content and um, the platforms to use. So understanding the difference between Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, your newsletter, etc. in terms of algorithms in and of itself will save you a lot of headaches. Um, Facebook's algorithm and Instagram's at this point is very much, it, while they used to be um, linear in that they were based on your, the time. So anybody who posted in the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten minutes, you would see hour, two hours. So it was chronological algorithm um, timelines. Then they changed that to become based on engagement. So essentially, the more, the better your content, the more people engage with your content quickly, the more they push your content to more people to be seen. So if, for example, we post um, 
a photo that doesn't get more than let's say 50 likes in the first hour, the likelihood of Instagram pushing our content to more timelines decreases. Um, so hence the importance of creating or getting to the habit of creating good quality content, um, video and um, video. Facebook and Instagram both prioritize video content at this point. Um, then Facebook prioritizes articles. So articles get pushed to more people than they do um, photo and or just text. And then Instagram after video prioritizes obviously photos because you can't do anything else on there. How to get video content on a small budget. The question of the century. Oh Lord, yes, the question of the century. The good thing is that there are a lot of um, video apps that allow you to create your own videos. Um, I, wish I, I wish I remembered, I have a, like a note of what they're called, but a lot of times we think that we need to invest, uh, you know, twin tens of thousands of dollars into a good video when lo-fi videos actually perform really well. So videos that are taken on iPhone perform well. Um, so through storytelling, if, you, if you're telling a story, if you're asking ambassadors or if you're taking testimonials from folks who have participated in your programs, having them send in um, videos of themselves speaking to their phones, just as impactful. Compiling that easily um, into a little kind of video edit, um, just as impactful. Same with graphic videos. I wish I remembered the name of these video tools and, and maybe that's something we can send out right after. Um, but a lot of things can become DIY with limited budget. And if you don't have the budget for video, pictures speak just as well. And that's literally free. Canva is a great app for great um, kind of content creation in terms of Insta, if you want to do like a graphic, Instagram art, et cetera. Canva is our go-to. Um, if you don't have access to Adobe Suite, it's free. Phone cameras should be very high quality already, but they generally don't record sound well. So big pro tip, get a mic. Super cheap to get on Amazon. Something that plugs into your phone. There you go. Um, are there any other questions, comments, concerns, fears, stresses? Um, I wanna make sure folks leave a little bit more clear on how to go about this. What are ways to engage individuals that, it, that are in denial of issues? Depends who your target audience is. Um, our talk, we, we often speak at Apathy is Boring to unengaged youth. Um, so understanding that folks who are in denial, oftentimes it's a question of education and accessibility. Um, so making sure that they understand the realities that you are trying to um, push to them. So before we can speak to youth about going to education to the policymakers. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll speak specifically to youths. Um, so youth who are unengaged, we understand that, okay, before we can ask them to vote, there's a whole other education process that needs to happen there. Hence our RISE program where they're engaged a little bit more longer and the intervention process for folks who tend to be unengaged needs to be a little bit longer. Um, you can't necessarily convince someone who is in denial of issues through an Instagram post. It takes a little bit more of a deeper intervention, a little bit more conversation, a little more exchange um, uh, and being aware of that. So if, if your target audience is, you know, folks who are um, in denial, then that might be a bit tough to do solely online. So I would speak to folks who are a little bit more open and education and accessibility of information is always key in that. What are actions that can be done in deeper interventions? Um, I mean, I'm not an intervention specialist. However, programs in general, that's why, that's why organizations have programs. That why, that's why we ourselves have a RISE program that take folks um, and walk them through the education a little bit more, a little bit longer. 
um, presents issues to them in a, um, in a successful manner, have them engage and listen and conversate um, for a period of three, four, five, six months, in and of itself opens up the mind a little bit more. I don't know if that answers your question, but okay. I applied actually, but did not get in because I could not go to the trip. Okay, arrives, great. So we have about four minutes left um, and I'll use this time then to um, invite folks who are aged 18 to 30 and who want to be a little bit more engaged, um, who want to make a difference and are like, how the hell, where the fuck, what, excuse my French, um, do I start? We have applications for the sixth cohort of our RISE program that opens up on, that already opens up, that, that are open um, and happening in the fall. Normally we meet in person in eight cities across the country. So Montreal, Toronto, Ottawa, Winnipeg, Halifax, Edmonton, and Vancouver. If you're in those cities and are interested in building community and learning more, by all means, please, please, please apply. We, we need more of this conversation, more of these spaces for youth um, to engage in, in issues that matter. Okay. Three minutes. Any last round of questions, comments, concerns? It's now or never, folks. Now or never. Good. I take it as you are all doing great. Can I get a camera view for everyone who is comfortable so I see folks' faces? Hi. Hi, Sarah. Hello. Hi, Gabby. Hi, Jenny. Thank you for joining, guys. Hi, Melina. Hi, Brianna. So many faces. <laughs> OK, great. Thank you, folks, for the program at this time. Oh, for the program, Michelle, you can, all the information is on apathyisboring.com um, slash join rise. All your questions are there. Um, but you can email us separately if that's something that you want to dive into deeper with someone. Okay, take care of yourselves. Good luck with all of your work, with all of your mission. You're all doing such important work. Thank you for spending a few minutes with us today. Bye.